切的。Thank you,、uh, Your Honors. Now、um, we've just seen Mr. Stanisic and his special unit under Malenko Karashik, and I do want to talk briefly about the special units、um, under the law on internal affairs for the RS MOOP. Article 36 was the provision that、uh, gave the minister the power to create special units, and we have evidence in this case that, that Mr. Karashik's special unit. Was under the direct authority of <coughs> Mr. Stanisic.、Um, Mr. Polnoyevich testified testified about that at transcript one six four zero four. We've had other witnesses indicate that and other documents that reflect it. But I also want to talk about Dushko Malovich.、Um, he was head of the special police platoon.、Uh, Sometimes referred to as the Sokolats、uh, platoon,、um, we say the evidence shows that this group was also under the direct authority of Minister Stanisic. Exhibit P one four two two is a fifteen June ninety two document, an order from Mr. Stanisic to、uh, Mr. Malovich's unit, the Sokolats unit, special police.、Uh, To carry out mobilization of conscripts, and、uh, we've you've seen a number of payroll documents concerning Mr. Malovich's unit. Michel Davidovich testified at transcript one three six zero six about Mr. Malovich and his unit being under the authority of the minister.、Uh, we've had a lot of debate, I guess, between between me and defense counsel. Uh, about uh, whether or not Malovich and his unit were responsible for personal security of the minister, we have had some evidence about that.、Uh, Mr. Planoyevich, in his、um, suspect interview with the OTP,、uh, had indicated that's what he did. But when Mr. Planoyevich came to testify, he backed off that testimony, and I, I think. You'll recall I went through that with him in his statement about how he first came to mention it. It wasn't in response to a question. He volunteered it,、uh, which is more consistent with it being genuine.、Uh, we think his change of testimony was because he was here in front of Mr. Stanisic,、uh, and that drove the change.、Um, you should also look at Mr. Kovacs's statement. Uh, to the Bielina Prosecutor's Office, investigating the murder of the three Muslim families in September of '92. I'll talk more about that in a minute.、Um, let me move to the Bielina murders. Next slide, please. I know this is not a charged incident in the case, but we think、uh, it's necessary to talk about it because it reflects on.、Uh, Matters of credibility regarding Mr. Stanisic and other witnesses in the case. It also relates to his connection with the Malovich unit,、uh, which ties in with the failure to punish certain individuals and, and to take actions. And so, let me talk about it briefly. Mr. Stanisic has worked very hard to have any connection between him and that event removed or obscured. Uh, Mitra Davidovich testified at transcript thirteen five five two through five four and thirteen six zero four through zero seven, as well as in his ninety two terse statement P fifteen fifty seven point zero one at paragraphs one fifty one and one fifty two. Malovich、uh, generally admitted. That his unit had done that crime. Davidovich told told you that、uh, he had a meeting with Mr. Stanisic、uh, after he, Davidovich, had spoken with the OTP on on other matters, and Mr. Stanisic asked him、uh, if he had said anything 
about that event. Reading from Davidovich's transcript, 13552. On one occasion, I met with Mr. Stanisich in Sremska Mitrovica, and Stanisich had some questions about why I talked to the investigators of the tribunal, whether he was also interesting to them, whether I had given any statements. And I said, yes, I talked to them. They also asked about him in that context, his activities concerning the disarming of paramilitaries in Zvornik and other places was also discussed. And as far as this family from Bialina is concerned, I said that question had not been asked. And then he said, please don't place me in that context because he doesn't want to get involved and he doesn't want me to place him in any context related to that. And that's the first time this family was mentioned with him. He goes on to talk about uh, meeting Dusko Malovich in Belgrade uh, sometime after the event, asking him who killed those people there, and Malovich told him that Drago Vukovic, the head of secret police, the state security in Bialina, had ordered it. Uh, and shortly after that conversation, Micho Stanisic and Frankie Samadovic arrived. This was in Belgrade at the Bosanska Via and Stanisic uh, and, and Davidovich left shortly after that. Now, this was public knowledge at the time. You heard the testimony that the Radical Party, uh, headed by Mirko Blagojevich and Bielina, had put out a press release about the murders and suggesting that it had been committed by Dusko Malovich and his unit. Um, it's interesting to note also that eight days later, eight days after the murder, on the 3rd of October, there was a collegium of the RS MOOP in Bialina, presided over by Mr. Stanisic. Mr. Kovac was at that meeting, and Mr. Kovac is listed as having briefed the group on the security situation. Now, I asked him when he testified if he recalled having informed the group about the murders. And I don't have his precise answer in front of me. Please refer to the transcript. But I think the gist was he didn't recall if he knew and if he knew whether or not he had said anything about it. It's hard to imagine that the murder of three Muslim families, 25-some people, including women and children, happening in a town like Bihalina at that time and having been mentioned in the press was not something that would have been part of the security briefing eight days later in Bialina. Um, and I even asked Mr. Davidovich a question about whether he had an opinion as to whether it was possible that the minister did not know about it. And Judge Hall rightly uh, it admonished me that I was really asking him to speculate. Um, and I, 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 took his, I took his suggestion um, because he said that uh, maybe what I needed to do uh, was raise it later. Transcript page 13607. Judge Hall, we have the evidence of the publicity of this. We have the evidence of the fact that the number one accused was a minister at the time. And it is probably an inference, a reasonable inference, that you would, at the appropriate time, invite the chamber to draw. But I think that's as far as you can take it now with the question for this witness. And I said, I take your point, Your Honor. I will save that for submissions later. That's my submission now. And all the evidence, I think it is a reasonable inference to draw. Thank you. Um, also related to that, Mr. Stanisic uh, made a statement to the Bialina Prosecutor's Office that was investigating the case. In 2003, he wrote a statement. It's in Exhibit P1543 at pages 65 to 67. Uh, and in that, he claims he didn't know anything about it until apparently some years later uh, that uh, he had issued an order for Dusko Malovich to be sent to Bialina and put at the disposal of Michal Davidovich, head of the public security station, and under the full control of MOOP senior officer Tomo Kovac and Chato Klyach. 
Uh, he said he never got any information concerning any unlawful activities of the special police platoon or Malovich. And that he was never informed about the incident, either in writing or verbally, as stipulated in the instructions. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't learn about the event until sometime after December 92, after he left the MOOP. He said, I wish to reiterate that atrocities of this sort make me especially eager to seek accountability of whoever the perpetrators may be especially if they come from the ranks of those who professionally take care of protecting please, lives. Please, 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 please. Sorry. I do get speedy sometimes. Uh, we say he had good reason to know who it was, and he didn't take any action. And concerning his version of what happened, You've heard testimony from Mr. Davidovich and Mr. Andan. Mr. Davidovich wasn't head of the public security station. He was already gone from Bialina uh, by the end of August. He certainly wasn't there in September, in late September when the murders happened. Mr. Andan confirmed that. Mr. Andan wasn't there either because he'd been removed, he'd been suspended by Mr. Stanisich's decision on the 9th or 10th of September. Uh, you have that document in evidence confirmed by Mr. Kovach. Now, we don't have the information from Mr. Kleich, but Mr. Kovach also made a statement about those events, and that's in Exhibit P2460 at pages 5 and 6 of the English and page 4 of the BCS. He says, on my first arrival at the Bialina SJB in September 92, I found the so-called Dusko Malovich's platoon, headed at that time by Malovich, uh, by Malovich's deputy, Kazunovich, who told me uh, at that time their job was to provide security for MOOP Bialina SJB buildings. I also know that they had gone a number of times from that location and provided security for Mr. Stanisic while he was moving through the territory. Uh, they briefly stayed until November, approximately, uh, when they definitively left the area following Mr. Stanisic's removal. That is everything of the task they carried out that I and the police administration knew about, and I believe that as far as I know, they weren't receiving any other task. Uh, although I did not have any command over them because, as provided by law at that time, they were directly linked to Minister Stanisic, and they never set off anywhere uh, without Malovich's order. And uh, it may shed some light on it. P737 is a 30 October interview of Mr. Stanisic in Yavnost, magazine or newspaper, one of the questions that he was asked at page three of the English and column three on the single page in BCS, question, some are inclined to accuse the special units of the Ministry of the Interior of the abuse of power when performing their duties in Bielina. Stanisic said, we're determined to protect our constitutional order and unity of Republic of Serbska, because we're obliged to do so by the Constitution. Anyone who decides to disturb the above mention has to be aware that we are categorically going to use all of the available legal measures to prevent and defeat such attempts. It is not true that the special unit abused the power and Bialina. No question to the reporter about well, what abuses are you talking about. He just simply categorically denies it. All right, let me move on briefly to the next slide. Paramilitaries. We have some brief information about that. Uh, Mr. Nielsen, in his expert report, talks about the relationship between the RS MOOP and paramilitaries uh, in his exhibit uh, 508. 
page, paragraphs 361 to 378. Um, Mr. Davidovich told you that Stanisic had an agreement with Archon about coming to Sarajevo and in exchange for their assistance in helping fight, uh, they were allowed to loot and take what they wanted from the area. Uh, regarding paramilitaries in Sarajevo, you also have in evidence information about Sheshel's men uh, and some local paramilitaries in Ilija, including Bernie's Chetniks, Bernie Gavrilovich. Um, have a look at Exhibit P646, which is a 6th August report from Ilija, Tomo Kovac, basically his last day as chief in Ilija before he went to join MOOP headquarters. In it, he's praising the work of volunteers, serve volunteers, compared to the work of the VRS in Ilija. Uh, and it includes the information about the amount of ammunition that the RS MOOP has furnished to those volunteers to help in the fighting. Next slide, please. Camps, uh, detainees, and exchanges. Discussed in our final trial brief at paragraph 648 to 668, uh, in Stanisic's brief, I think he tries to make the claim that he didn't know about this until the July Collegian on the 11th in Belgrade. Uh, the evidence is clear that he had information to put him on notice about it far before that. He knew from the very start. On the 6th of April, uh, after Rata had been taken over by Karashik Mandich, non-Serb cadets had been captured, and Stanisic ordered them interrogated uh, and then to be exchanged for Serb prisoners, including Radimir Koyic, uh, the gentleman who we saw on the intercept earlier in my remarks. This testimony comes from Mr. Stepina at transcript 8300 through 04. On 6 June, you have an evidence P427.07. Uh, it's an order from the Central Exchange Commission, the body that was created to deal with exchange of prisoners and dead bodies and other persons. Uh, it was directed to those whose employees were securing persons in custody. And if you look at the last page of that exhibit, you'll note that it was sent to the MOOP, to CSBs, uh, but it was not sent to the Army. So on the 6th of June, at least the Exchange Commission uh, had the understanding that prisoners were being guarded uh, by the police. On the 10th of June, Exhibit P179.7, um, it's a government session, maybe that's .07. Uh, it's a government session attended by Minister Stanisic, and during the meeting, there's a uh, mention of the Ministry of Justice to report about prisoners with special attention on the treatment of civilian population. All information putting Stanisic on notice about detainees being detained in facilities guarded by the police before the 11th of July. Let me go to a new topic. Next slide. Uh, a big argument put forward during the defense case uh, was that Mr. Stanisic couldn't have any effective control over subordinates because of interference from the crisis staffs. Um, talked about the appointment of SJB chiefs. <coughs> Recall, first of all, how things happened in the beginning. Um, the variant A and variant B instructions were issued to the SDS municipal organs. Uh, um, 
in variant A was for those municipalities where there was a served majority where they effectively were in power in charge of the municipal assembly. Variant B to those municipalities where they were a minority and had to set up basically a shadow government and work covertly. Uh, but those instructions provided for the SDS to uh, include as a member in their crisis staffs in the municipality in variant A to include the chief of police or the commander because in a Serb majority municipality, one of those two positions would be held by a Serb under the inter-party agreement about division of appointments. In the in the uh, variant B municipalities, that was not the case. And the instruction in variant A and variant B was to include someone from all the appropriate municipal organs that was a Serb uh, to be in that position so that when the time came, of, came for a takeover, that person could assume the role. That's how some of these SDS-appointed police chiefs came into being because when the split happened and when the MOOP, the RS MOOP came into being on 30 March, according to Mr. Stanitz's pronouncement in Sokolats, uh, he and the RS MOOP wasn't in a position to make appointments all over the board. So <clears throat> that's why they didn't have RS MOOP appointees in some municipalities at the beginning. However, the RS MOOP could and did replace municipality uh, appointed or SDS crisis staff appointees during 1992. Mr. Bielsevich told you, oh, uh, we couldn't do anything about Stavlo Todorovic and Bosanski Shamach because he was appointed by the local municipal authorities, the crisis staff. So he wasn't really a member of the MOOC, so we couldn't discipline, we couldn't do anything. That's not, that's not the case. Mr. Olmsted may speak a little further about this, but you have the example in Zvornik. Uh, just after the Yellow Wasp roundup, the local police chief, I think it was Mr. Vasilich, uh, was replaced by the IRS MOOC, and he was a crisis staff or provisional government or whatever the body was called in Svornik at that time, he had been appointed by the municipal authorities. No hesitation in replacing him. Article 27 of the Law on Internal Affairs uh, calls for SJBs to execute the regulations pertaining to law and order issued by the municipal authority. So it's agreed that in time of emergency or state of imminent threat of war, the crisis staff stands in place of the municipal authority, so this provision should be read as applying to them. And if the crisis staff is passing some regulation uh, pertaining to law and order, and we say setting a curfew, uh, maybe ordering the roundup of weapons from suspected individuals who might try and overthrow the government, all those kind of things are regulations pertaining to law and order. And the law on internal affairs says that the police station, that the SJB is to implement those orders. Um, Mr. Stanisich's final trial brief citations about interference don't really support the point. Have a look at the footnotes 600 and 600, or paragraph 600 to 601, and footnotes 1193 to 1195. Uh, those documents. Uh, don't really stand for the point that they pertain or that they purport to support. For example, P750 is one of the footnoted documents. That's a document from the War Presidency of Kluge addressed to Banja Luka because they have received uh, dispatches that are asking them to uh, set up facilities and accept prisoners who are now being moved out of Maniacha and returned to various local municipalities. And the Kluge war staff says, 
we, we, we can't do that. We're unable to provide reception centers. We don't meet the basic requirements for that. Uh, we're proposing to delay the return until further notice. Uh, or they're taken over by humanitarian organizations operating in Banya Luka with reception centers, with reception centers at their disposal. It's not a review. This is not the crisis staff ordering the local police to do anything. It's a request from the crisis staff to Banya Luka CSB for relief from something that they don't have the facilities to do. Um, P668 is one of the footnoted documents, uh, and it's from Simo Durliacha to Mr. Zupaninen informing him that the Priador War Presidency has decided to reduce the number of policemen guarding prisoners in Karaturm, Ternopoli, and Omarska. It notes that the armies refused to take up that duty, and Mr. Durliacha is requesting uh, that some arrangement be made with the army and saying he cannot, he cannot implement the crisis staff decision it's not that he's implementing a crisis staff decision contrary to what the, what the MOOP wants. He's been requested to implement something, and he's not doing it. So this is the exact opposite of the point the defense is trying to make. It's not the crisis staff interfering with the work of the police. Have a look at each of those documents cited for those footnotes I mentioned. Uh, and see uh, whether they pertain or not. Skip the next slide, please. And can we go to uh, P163? Yes. Now, regarding the relationship between the municipal authorities or the regional authorities and the RS MOOP, at the Trebinia Collegium on the 20th of August, Mr. Stannis has addressed this directly. It's in Exhibit P-163 at page 8 of the English and pages 10 through 12 of the BCS. And this is one of the conclusions pointed out by Mr. Stannis. Number one, CSB chiefs and their associates must be and are the representatives of the ministry for the region which is why they should establish day-to-day -day cooperation with Republican deputies, the assembly guys, uh, from the region and other representatives of the regional authorities. SJB chiefs should, in the same manner, establish relations with representatives of the municipal authorities. The reason for this is that we are a professional service protecting the interests of the people and such an activity and orientation requires direct daily contact with representatives of the legal authorities. As we've said before, in relating to the issue of subordination, and I would say relating to this issue about relations between the crisis staffs and police, really doesn't matter. This is a joint criminal enterprise. They're in it together. At that same meeting, uh, Mr. Stanisic also made a remark that I may be stealing from Mr. Olmsted. Uh, if we could look at the next slide. In item number five, he said, when performing their duties, police officers cannot take sides, whatever the demands and attempts in this stage of establishing the organs of municipal and Republican authority. Their work must be only must only be based on the law. It's the only way to avoid contributing to the instability of the situation in a certain area. In this sense, we must resolutely support each and every one of our members, even when they overstep the exercise of lawful authority to a limited degree. That's reflective of the general attitude that we talked about during the trial. Uh, in our pleadings, uh, Serbs didn't want to arrest other Serbs for crimes against non-Serbs. 
in the context of this conflict. Two or three other brief items. Thank you. Credibility. Next slide, please. You're the judges of credibility. Sat here in the courtroom. You watched everybody come in and testify in front of you. Uh, you will make those decisions. Uh, I suggest to you in many cases you have to reject substantial portions of the testimony of some individuals because they simply were not credible, not reliable. Talked about Stanisich's interview uh, and reasons that may undermine credibility about portions of that. But I want to mention in particular two defense, uh, two witnesses, one who actually testified in the prosecution case, Mr. Mandich, and a defense witness, Mr. Machar. Mandich, uh, just one little episode that is reflective, I think. Uh, you'll see his cross-examination by Ms. Corner. Uh, he had testified in the Kryzhnik case that regarding his infamous dispatch of 31 March, separating the MOOP, um, that in Kryzhnik he testified under oath that Micho Stanisic ordered him to send that out. When he came here, after meeting with the defense, he testified that Oh, no, no, I, I was wrong. That was a mistake. It wasn't, it wasn't Mr. Stanisic. It was uh, Valibor Ostoich, the Minister of Information, who reminded him that the law on internal affairs had been uh, passed on the 23rd of March and was due to come into effect eight days later, and therefore, because he was the highest ranking served in the joint group, he had a responsibility to send it out, and he sent it out. Read that testimony, uh, transcript 9405 to 9409 and see if it's plausible. It's really not. Uh, the way he testified about it initially makes much more sense. Mr. Stanisic would have been the one to tell him to do it. Mr. Stanisic on the 30th of March had announced from today we have our own survey MOOP in Sokolots. The dispatch goes out the very next day. When he testified here that it was Ostoyic, and he was asked, well, where, where was Mr. Mandich at this, uh, where was Mr. Stansic at this time? He ended up by saying, oh, uh, he was on vacation. He wasn't on vacation. He was doing his tour of the autonomous regions announcing the new Serbian group. He was in Sokolac on the 30th. He was on Trebinia on the 31st. You have evidence about that. Mr. Machar was a defense witness. He was biased. He volunteered favorable information on topics where he really had no basis of knowledge to assert the things he claimed. Two short examples about him. One, really in a, in a non-responsive answer, he took the opportunity to slam Micho Davidovich by saying that he was not a person uh, who, uh, quote, uh, page 23411, Mr. Davidovich, he had no experience with the Crime Enforcement or the Criminal Procedure Act. He had experience with something else altogether. And a cross-examination, I asked him, well, how much did he really know about Mr. Davidovich? Did he know he'd been a policeman since 1974, that he'd uh, worked as chief of the general crime section in the Tuzla CSB, uh, which covered 18 municipalities. He was in charge of 17 plainclothes detectives. He later became the SJB chief in Bialina. He then became the chief inspector in the federal soup in Belgrade. And pointing out all, all those things to him, I asked him if that would change his opinion about whether or not uh, he had no experience. And asked him if he was willing to withdraw his comments. Page 23, 412, he said no. He knew nothing about him. He ventured that opinion, and when faced with the evidence that he was wrong, he still refused to agree. And the other story he told about Priador and his snub by Mr. Derliaccio. He claimed that he first had gone to Banyuluk at CSB and met with Mr. Zuplinen, 
who opened the door and discovered that he had failed to forward on the message to Priador about the inspection that Machar and his group were going to do. But when he came to testify here, he then recalled, oh, no, no, it really wasn't Mr. Zublin who did it. It was Mr. Bulich, a dead guy, conveniently, who had told him that. And he didn't know why he said Stanisic before when he talked to the prosecutor, uh, but that was wrong. And that when he went to Priador, he helpfully added for the defense that Mr. Jerry Liacha said, uh, I'm not having anything to do with you because my bosses, which Mr. Matcher explained, he understood to mean municipal <coughs> authority, didn't tell me anything about it. Well, they wouldn't have told him anything about it because his municipal bosses wouldn't have known about it. The whole story about uh, Zhuplin forgetting to send the document and the snub doesn't hold up. You saw the kind of man Mr. Machar was and the position he held. It doesn't make sense that he would have suffered a snub like that without having gone to Zhuplin right away to tell him about his subordinate acting that way or reporting it. He claims he reported it, but we have no document. We found no document. He sat on the collegium with Mr. Durliacha in 1994, never raised anything about it. You've heard evidence about the disciplinary procedure changing, and he could have raised it himself. He did not. It does not make sense. He explained how angry and humiliated he was by the event, and he took no action. doesn't make sense. Finally, uh, one brief video. This is P2039. It's just some video footage from the assembly session on the 30th and 31st of October in Priador. We just want you to see uh, who's attending. Crash, Nick. Mitchell Stanisic. Mr. Mandich. Mr. Zhuplin. <coughs> Mrs. Plavsic. And Mr. Carriage. Finally, Your Honor, in summing up, my time is, is out. Mitchell Stanisic's early and substantial participation in, in and his contributions to the creation of the RS and the RS MOOP combined with the fact that he was called back in 1994 for a second term as a minister of the RS MOOP. That alone should tell you something about how his colleagues viewed him and what he'd helped do in 1992. And during which time, in 1994, his second term, he didn't do anything to punish the personnel who he knew, by his own admission in some cases, whom he knew had been involved in crimes and or cover-ups of crimes committed by police, show his support for those crimes and those perpetrators. You take all that together, it clearly establishes that he was a knowing and willing participant in the JCE, and you should find him guilty on all counts. Thank you.
Your Honors, ordinarily, the police play a central role in the protecting the citizens of a country. As Drago Borobchanin testified, in every government, there are some ministries which are the most important. Among them is always the Ministry of Interior, which is in charge of maintaining law and order and protecting citizens and their property. That's transcript page 6828. During per periods of ethnic conflict, the police role in protecting citizens, and in particular those susceptible to persecution, is crucial. Tomislav Kovac acknowledged this, referring to the unlawful imprisonment and mistreatment of non-Serbs at detention facilities throughout the RS, he admitted, according to the law and according to the hierarchy, we, that is the RS MOOP, were the strongest structure within the state. And therefore, our legal and our ethical duty and obligation was to prevent these occurrences. Transcript page 27. 151. While the VRS had the responsibility not to engage in activities that unlawfully harmed the citizens of the former BIH, the RS MOOP was unique among the Serb forces in that they bore the affirmative duty under the law to do everything in their power to protect the population. Under Article 42, of the RS Law on Internal Affairs, this affirmative duty of the police applied, quote, at all times, regardless of whether they are on duty or whether such a duty is part of a special assignment, and even when their life is endangered. Amidst the endemic and systematic crimes that were committed against the Muslims, the Croats, and other non-Serbs, in the territory of the RS from the onset of the indictment period, the police should have dedicated their attention and resources to protecting the non-Serb population. This, the evidence shows, they did not do. The most blatant evidence of the failure of the police to protect the non-Serb population was their direct participation in the crimes committed against that population, as described yesterday by Mr. Demergen. Another important aspect of the police failure to protect was their failure to investigate, arrest, and punish Serb perpetrators of crimes against the non-Serb population. And this is what I will address. The evidence shows that the police stood at the threshold of the criminal justice system. It was their duty to conduct the initial investigation of a crime, to identify and arrest perpetrators, to preserve evidence, and to initiate the criminal proceedings by filing a criminal report with the prosecutor that was supported by sufficient proof of that crime. Even after filing a criminal report, the police remained an integral part of the criminal justice process. The prosecutor and court depended upon the police to conduct searches to locate and bring in witnesses, to secure evidence and crime scenes, and to conduct forensic examinations. And where there was evidence of additional crimes, to file supplemental criminal reports regarding those crimes. As the former Sansky Most Prosecutor Delich testified, if the police did not perform their role, quote, the criminal procedures could not be completed. Transcript page one, five, two, six. So how well did the police perform their duties to investigate and report Serb perpetrators of crimes against non-Serbs in 1992? The chamber admitted into evidence the reports of RS District Prosecutor Gacinovic and RS MOOP Head of the Police Vasic, which analyzed the data contained in the criminal case logbooks of the municipal and regional police and prosecutors offices from the indictment period. Both witnesses 
focused their attention on identifying in these logbooks any crimes that fell within the indictment schedules. They also looked for serious crimes committed by Serb perpetrators against non-Serb victims. In particular, they looked at uh, crimes of violence, such as war crimes, murder, rape, serious bodily injury, and robberies, as well as grave property crimes, such as those committed with explosive devices. Ms. Gacinovic also um, identified cases of aggravated theft against non-Serbs. Even with this inclusion of a, this additional crime, her data did not differ significantly from Mr. Vasic's. However, for consistency, uh, the aggravated thefts have been excluded from the summary I shall now provide. In eight charged municipalities, Pale, Visegrad, Bozanski Shamats, Vlasenica, Ilyash, Belecha, Gatsko, and Kluch, the police filed no criminal reports for serious crimes committed by Serbs against non-Serbs during the indictment period. Not one. In seven charged municipalities, Vogosja, Bielina, Priador, Birchko, Donjovakov, Kodovaros, and Skandervakov, the police reported just one serious crime committed by Serbs against non-Serbs during the entire indictment period. In Priador, Kodovaros, and Skandervakov, the sole crime was an attempted murder, and the attempted murder case in Kodovaros was reported before the Serbs took over the SJB and the municipality in June of 1992. In two charged municipalities, Zvornik and Doboy, the police reported only two serious crimes committed by Serbs against non-Serbs. And in Sansky Most, the police reported four such crimes. This includes a rape case that Your Honors heard evidence about that resulted in a suspended sentence in 1993 under the reasoning that the victim and the majority of the other Muslims from Sansky Most had moved away, making it less likely that the perpetrator would commit the same or similar crimes in the future. That's P122. In Teslich, the police reported five crimes, serious crimes against non-Serbs. One of the five, the criminal report against the Mice group, did not appear in the police crime logbook for Teslich, but it did appear in the prosecutor's logbook. This is precisely why the crime logbooks of both the police and the prosecutor's office were analyzed to deliver a complete and accurate picture to the trial chamber. Finally, in Banja Luka, the logbooks reveal that the police filed 18 criminal reports for serious crimes by Serb perpetrators against non-Serb victims during the indictment period. As several of these criminal reports pertain to the same perpetrators, for related crimes, the number is, in fact, closer to 14, as we discuss in our final brief. Compared to the other 19 municipalities, 14 criminal cases may seem significant. However, this number pales in comparison to the 4,660 reports filed by the police in Luka in 1992. Nor does it adequately account for the large number of non-Serbs who were murdered, robbed, and exposed to other acts of violence, often by criminals with direct links to the Serb police and politicians, as described by a number of Banja Luka witnesses, as well as the adjudicated facts. For example, the unchallenged adjudicated fact 1067 states that over 31 non-Serbs were killed by Serb forces in Banja Luka municipality between March and October of 1992. However, the police in Banja Luka reported that for the expanded period of the 1st of January through the 20th of December, based upon the combined work of the SJB, the CSB, 
and the military police, only three criminal cases were filed against Serb perpetrators for the killing of only eight non-Serbs. This could be found in 1D233. According to this report, five of these eight non-Serb victims were killed by the Shugic brothers, and two were killed by Jelko Cheko. The two murders by Cheko occurred on the 5th of December 1992, and so are, in addition to those covered by adjudicated fact 1067. Soon after their initial arrest, the Shugic brothers <coughs> and Cheko were released from detention, allowed to return to their VRS units, and were not prosecuted for these murders during the conflict. As evidenced by Ms. Gotinovich's report, the figures I have provided for the 20 charged municipalities did not significantly improve between 1993 and 1995. In other words, it was not just a matter of the police needing time to investigate the crimes committed against non-Serbs in 1992. Throughout the conflict, these crimes were simply disregarded. Vasic and Gacinovic's data is consistent not only with each other, but also with the evidence of former judges, prosecutors, and SJB chiefs who testified before this chamber, as well as echoed in the evidence of the crime-based witnesses. For example, ST-79 testified that the Visegrad police did not interfere in any way with the criminal activities of paramilitaries. And as a result, quote, there was no trust whatsoever, either in the police or the army. To me, it all seemed that these white eagles who were doing this throughout the town, and even while the Uzici Corps was there, it appeared to me that they were under their... Sorry, it appears that the, the, the accused and the, uh, and the rest of the, the, the lawyers that does not get the, uh, the Serbian translation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Mm. But. Is, it, is it working now? They're indicating that they can hear now. And Mr. Holmes said you may wish to slow down, please. I will slow down. Thank you. And uh, I'll just go back and, and finish the quote of ST-79. To me, it all seemed that these white eagles who were doing this throughout the town, and even while the Uzici Corps was there, it appeared to me that they were under their protection. That's transcript page 2247. This statistical information does not speak by itself. Rather, it is the evidence of the widespread crimes committed against the non-Serb population that gives this data articulation, including the 1,735 non-Serb victims of killing incidents charged in an indictment, which represents only a fraction of the total number of non-Serb killings that occurred in the charged municipalities and the many more instances of beatings, rapes, robberies, and other violent crimes committed against the non-Serb population. This is the bigger picture, Your Honors, in which the police failure to investigate and report crimes must be assessed. What, what, what is clear to us from viewing this data 20 years later must have been evident to the accused in 1992 through the daily reports they received and their other sources of information about the work of their subordinates and could only have been terrifyingly obvious to the non-Serb population living amidst these uninvestigated and undeterred crimes. In, in response to this evidence, the defense rely on three arguments. First, that the prosecutor's offices and judiciary were not functioning in 1992. Second, that the SJBs lacked the resources to investigate crimes. And third, that the military had sole jurisdiction to investigate the crimes at issue in this case. None of these arguments is supported by credible evidence. The prosecutor's offices and courts were functioning in 1992. 
many without interruption caused by the outbreak of the conflict. For instance, the entries in prosecutor's office logbooks for Zvornik, Teslich, Sansky Most, Pale, Bielina, and Bani Luka, which also covered Donya Vakuv and Skander Vakuv, showed that these prosecutor's offices were functioning continuously from early April, 19, uh, early April 1992 onwards. Ms. Kachinovich provided evidence that after the conflict began, she continued to perform her role as deputy prosecutor in Trebinje, which had jurisdiction over Belecha, until she was appointed Trebinje district prosecutor in August. In Vasanitsa, the prosecutor's office logbook shows that the office was open for business from 14 May onwards. With few exceptions, the judicial process was, at most, only briefly disrupted in the municipalities when the Serb authorities fired the non-Serb prosecutors and judges from their positions. Serbs who already held these positions remained in them, and the non-Serbs who had left were quickly replaced by other Serbs. For example, at a meeting in May in Sanski Most, the non-Serb prosecutor and the non-Serb president of the court were dismissed by the Sansky Most SDS leadership and at the same meeting replaced by Serbs. The former non-Serb judge and prosecutor were subsequently arrested and sent to Manjaca camp. The formal appointments of Serb judges and prosecutors by the RS government lagged behind the unofficial appointments at the municipal level. For example, former Visegrad prosecutor Drashko began performing hit the duties of prosecutor at the beginning of September, even though his formal appointment did not arrive until October. Nevertheless, the evidence shows that between May and October, the RS government issued appointments to 276 judges and 80 prosecutors. This can be found at P1318.23. The chamber has heard the evidence from a number of prosecutors and judges and each indicated that not only were their offices functioning, despite the difficult conditions, but they were willing and able to accept and process any criminal reports filed by the police. Even if the trial chamber were to accept the defense suggestion that the judiciary was slow to begin functioning, one would expect to see a flood of criminal reports filed, by, filed against Serb perpetrators for serious crimes against non-Serbs once these institutions began to function. This did not occur. In fact, the problem was not that the judiciary was dysfunctional, but rather that the police were simply not filing criminal reports. If we can look at the next slide. As Mandich wrote in his November 1992 report on the activities of the RS Ministry of Justice, we are faced with the fact that a large number of criminal acts have been carried out in Republika Srpska. Official organs have filed a small number of criminal reports to the judicial organs. That is why there is a distinct lack of cooperation between the prosecution organs and the Ministry of Interior. In his report on the crime situation in the area of Teslich municipality from June to September 1992, Teslich prosecutor Perich expressed a similar view, writing, recorded crime is a fraction of the real crime existing in society today. Most criminal acts remain undiscovered, and many crimes are tolerated by the authorities for various reasons. The prosecutor's office has knowledge of the day-to-day -day looting of property, houses, and business premises being set on fire and destroyed armed robbery, and murder being committed for base motives, etc. He then states, there is no criminal prosecution for most of these acts. He further reported, the destruction of religious buildings is a war crime against civilians because of the way and circumstances in which it was perpetrated. The Serbian people will carry a heavy burden of historical responsibility until the perpetrators of these and similar criminal acts are brought to justice. Perich then demands 
the state and its law enforcement organs must urgently answer the following question. What are the causes of these serious crimes, and why are they not being disclosed? An answer to this question should be sought from the command of the Teslich Serbian Brigade and the Interior Ministry organs. Your Honors, this question was left unanswered until this tribunal. Manage and Perich's reports emphasize the essential role of the police in the criminal justice system. Until the police identified the perpetrators of a crime and filed a criminal report against the known perpetrators, supported by sufficient evidence, the prosecutors in courts could not in initiate criminal proceedings. The prosecutor witnesses who testified during the trial confirmed this was the procedure that existed both prior to and during the conflict. It is also clear from the document evidence. For example, upon receiving the unknown perpetrator criminal report filed by Zhuplinin regarding the killing of non-Serb detainees outside Manjaca camp in early August, Deputy Prosecutor Kovacevic sent the report immediately back with the request that the CSB conduct a complete criminal investigation into this case in order to find perpetrators, witnesses, and other individuals and determine other circumstances related to the commission of this crime. After the perpetrators are found, they must be arrested. As Kovacevic testified, he was merely reminding the police of their independent duty to investigate and report such crimes before he could take any action with regard to the case. As the evidence showed, the police never comp complied with this request to complete the investigation, and as a result, the police perpetrators in this case were never prosecuted. The police were also aware that it was their duty to identify perpetrators. For example, at the end of Exhibit 1D360, an unknown perpetrator criminal report, CSB Doboy Chief Bielshevich informed the prosecutor's office, operative action and measures taken so far have not resulted in establishing the identity of the perpetrator or perpetrators. If found, we will send you a separate report. Note that the only document Bielshevich attached to this report was the court's on-site investigation report, as shown by other examples of unknown perpetrator criminal reports in evidence, the police typically conducted scant, if any, investigation before filing one of these reports. The filing of a criminal report against an unknown perpetrator therefore really served only an, an administrative purpose, permitting the police logbooks to reflect <coughs> that a criminal report was filed with the prosecutor's office, even though the police had not completed their duties to investigate the crime. And yet, after filing one of these unknown perpetrator reports, the police typically took no further action to solve the case. Ms. Kachinovich testified that her analysis of the unknown perpetrator reports filed with the prosecutor's office for serious crimes against non-Serbs in 1992 showed that generally the crimes remained uninvestigated and unsolved by the police throughout the conflict. In the rare instances when the police filed a criminal report against the Serb perpetrator for crimes against non-Serbs, the defense rightly criticized the prosecutors in courts for failing to indict, try, and convict those perpetrators. The hands of the prosecutors and the courts were by no means clean in this matter. For example, of the 18 criminal reports the police filed in Bani Luka for serious crimes committed by, non by Serbs against non-Serbs, most of the perpetrators were never prosecuted or convicted. The perpetrators charged in at least seven of these reports were released soon after their initial arrest, including Branko Plachkovic, Goran Davidovic, Radomir Boshkin, and the Shugic brothers. As detention in each of these cases was mandatory, the accused had the duty, given their high-level positions within the criminal justice system, not to remain idle while these perpetrators were unlawfully released. 
In fact, in one of the cases against Radomir Boshkin and two other members of the CSB Bani Luka Special Police Detachment, Zhuplinen facilitated the perpetrator's release, sending a clear message that the police would not stand in the way of a policy of releasing Serb perpetrators of crimes against non-Serbs. Would the speaker please slow down for the benefit of the interpreters? Thank you. The accused assert that by failing to act, they were just following the rules of procedure regarding detention, which gave the judiciary the power to extend detention or release suspects after the initial three-day period. However, their strict adherence to these procedures in the case of Serb perpetrators, such as Polachkovich and the Michi group, contrasts with their attitude toward the indefinite imprisonment of thousands of innocent non-Serbs in police-operated detention facilities throughout the RS. The defense's second argument, that the police were unable to investigate serious crimes in 1992, is contradicted by the RS MOOP's own year-end reports. For example, CSB Bondi Luca's year-end report shows that the police in the ARC filed criminal reports for 537 serious criminal offenses using the definition of Gacinovich and Vasic against 364 perpetrators between April and December 1992. That's found in P624. CSB Sarajevo reported that for the same period, it filed 118 criminal reports for serious crimes committed by 241 perpetrators. This is found in P740. The RS Moop year-end report indicated that for April through December period, the police filed 494 cases for crimes against life and limb. Incidentally, the RS Moop report also indicates that the police, quote, helped the military by arresting 9,469 army deserters and persons avoiding military service. This assistance illustrates that the police could arrest fugitives when they put their minds and their resources to it. When the, these numbers that I've just provided are compared to the findings of Vasic and Kachinovic, that the police filed only 38 criminal reports of serious crimes committed by Serbs against non-Serbs during the indictment period, they place in vivid relief the failure of the police to investigate and report crimes committed against the non-Serb population. Finally, the defense justify the police failure to investigate and report crimes against the non-Serb population by arguing that these crimes fell within the sole jurisdiction of the military courts. The Stanisic defense goes so far as making the assertion based on Mandic's testimony that all persons from 16 to 70 years of age were under the authority of the military judiciary. That can be found in paragraph 591. This notion of absolute military jurisdiction over all crimes flies in the face of the overwhelming evidence in this case. It should be noted that nowhere in their briefs do the defense address the evidence of former military prosecutor Novichinats on the military court's jurisdiction. They choose to ignore it completely. As Mr. Jovicinac explained, the primary jurisdiction of the military courts in 1992 was over crimes committed by members of the Army. Under Article 3 of the RS law on the Army, members of the Army were limited to soldiers, military cadets, reserve soldiers once they had reported to their military units for duty, and civilian employees under military contract. It did not include ordinary citizens or civilians. It did not include police officers. And it did not include reserve soldiers who had not yet joined their military units. The military court's jurisdiction over civilians was limited to the crimes enumerated under Article 13, Paragraph 1 of the SFI Law 
on the military courts. These crimes related to offenses against the state order, such as armed rebellion, and crimes against the army, such as desertion. The military courts did not have jurisdiction over general crimes committed by civilians against other civilians. In fact, Article 15 of the Law on the Military Courts states where a soldier and a civilian commit a crime as co-perpetrators, the civilian court had jurisdiction over both the military and civilian perpetrators. This is what happened against the Mitya group in Teslich. Article 16 of the Law on the Military Courts restricted the jurisdiction of the military courts even further. If a soldier who committed a general crime left the army before an indictment was filed, the civilian courts assumed jurisdiction over that former soldier. The restrictions on the military court's jurisdiction over crimes were practical as well. As the defense noted, the military courts were not fully functioning until July or August of 1992. And until then, it was incumbent upon the civilian police and courts to investigate all crimes, regardless of the status of the perpetrators. Once the military courts began to function, their two top priorities were, according to the VRS Prosecutor Office instructions found in Exhibit 2D107, crimes against the state order and crimes against the army, towards which the military courts and prosecutor's office expended considerable resources, as shown by their reports. Their third priority was war crimes, but as we can see from the contemporaneous orders issued by the VRS, such as P1098.20 and P685, as well as illustrated by the cases listed in the VRS prosecutor's annual report for 1992, that is P1284.55, this priority only pertained to war crimes committed by enemy combatants against Serbs. Your Honors have also heard evidence um, regarding the work of the VRS military courts in 1992 and admitted into evidence the 1KK Military Prosecutor Office logbooks for this period. This evidence is revealing in three respects. First of all, it shows that the military courts were not exercising jurisdiction over civilians. Secondly, it confirms that the civilian police were not filing criminal reports against Serb perpetrators, regardless of their status, for serious crimes committed against non-Serbs with the military prosecutor's office either. And thirdly, it shows that the military failed to prosecute Serb soldiers for crimes against non-Serbs. They were acting in the same manner as the civilian police. With regard to war crimes, the law on military courts is equally clear. The military exercised jurisdiction only over such crimes committed by soldiers or prisoners of war, that is, enemy combatants. This has been confirmed by witnesses Jovicinac, Drashko, and Gacinovic. It is also confirmed by the applicable SFRI regulations on the application of international laws of war in armed forces. Paragraph 37 of these regulations assigns military court jurisdiction. It reads, trials of military personnel who violate the laws of war, which entail criminal, criminal liability, fall under the jurisdiction of the Yugoslav military courts. If a member of a foreign armed force, that is an enemy combatant, violates the laws of war, he shall be tried by the military court. Noticeably absent from this provision is any indication that the military courts exercised jurisdiction over non-enemy civilians who committed war crimes. That is because they did not. Go to the next slide. That the police had jurisdiction to investigate war crimes committed by civilians is also evidenced by Stanisic's own instructions to his subordinates on 16 May. He wrote, Measures and activities conducted to document war crimes. These activities must involve collection of information 
and documents on war crimes against the Serbs. This implies conducting an on-site investigation with the entire team in all cases of crimes against the Serbs. And we particularly point out that a doctor's report must not be forgotten, and photo and video documentation, witness statements, and so on must be compiled pursuant to the law on criminal procedure. Clearly, Stanisic is instructing his police forces to investigate and file criminal charges for war crimes against Serbs, and not just those crimes outside the RS, as the defense have suggested. The order to conduct an on-site investigation and to comply with the rules of criminal procedure would otherwise make little sense. Your Honors, I'm advised that this is probably the best time to break. We return in 20 minutes. All right, we will event.